Amen. Thank you, Ben. Good morning, friends. How are we all doing today? How's the sound? Are we sounding okay? Third week in this venue, and we're still figuring out the rebounding and the echoing, so do bear with us. This week we have no doors. How cool is that? <laughs> they are replacing the doors throughout, and so please do bear with us. Uh, the bathroom doors, they also are missing. Uh, but there are some other partitions, so don't worry, you, you will be able to go to the loo in private. Um, but do bear with us. We'll be here a couple more weeks. Also going into some great uh, picnic services, not well, picnic services, but picnics out on the lawn. Um, just a great time of fellowship and food and hanging out. Um, but friends, isn't it good to be in church? Even when everyone's on holiday, it's still great to gather um, as few or as many just to celebrate the goodness of God. Don, thank you for leading us, bro. That was really powerful. Um, and the team, it's wonderful indeed. And again, if you are visiting, I know that we have a few visitors. You are super welcome. Great to have you joining us today. So thank you for coming. Um, we're not online today, just by the way, and we do record um, parts of the service and post that later. Um, but a huge welcome, and yes, as Ben mentioned, we do have baptisms next Sunday. Um, and this afternoon, after, after, the church, after the service today, if you are interested or have any questions or want to know more about what to expect next week, and if you're interested, do come along. Um, stick or stick around after the service today for about five to ten minutes, and we're just going to talk about what, about what to expect and what's happening. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. Sounds very really loud. Um, fantastic. So yes, as Ben has said, we are indeed continuing the series, Enjoying God. Enjoying God is part of our design. Um, and I'm just so encouraged by this series. The, the last month, beginning of last month, really just felt the Lord speak to me about a word for this church, which was to enjoy Him. I'm saying, Lord, what is, what is it that you wanting to communicate to the church in the next couple of months. And he just spoke so clearly about just enjoying it. That he is a God to be enjoyed. He is a God to be delighted in. To have fun in his presence. To enjoy him. So this series is really cool. Um, who has been enjoying God over the last two weeks, by the way? We started this series two weeks ago. Anyone who's been enjoying God a little bit more because of what we've been talking about? You know, the, um, the Westminster Shorter Catechism famously states that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, friends. It's part of our design. It's part of how God made us to delight in Him, to find joy in His presence. You know, Jesus, in His command to love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your body, all your strength. Friends, that's a call to joy. Because He knows that we enjoy Him when we love Him like that. With all that we are, there's a joy to that. He also talks about fruitfulness, doesn't He? John chapter 15 talks about abiding in Him. And bearing fruit. And bearing fruit takes that thing abiding. And we're talking about habits to cultivate that life-giving relationship with God. We're talking about how to form some of these habits. They don't just happen by themselves. These sort of Christian disciplines, if you will. Habits that will help us enjoy God. Because it doesn't just happen. We need to put some effort. Abiding takes a little bit of effort. It doesn't just happen. And uh, so we've um, been looking at that, exploring these habits. We've had five different ways next five these days. So we started two weeks ago enjoying God in rest, Sabbath rest, rhythms of enjoying God through slowing down. Okay, Sabbath is a person, Jesus. That's how we enter true rest. Enjoying God in the Word, the Bible, this beautiful book. And when we dive into it, it is full of life. And it reveals a God to be enjoyed. To be delighted in how we can read this word and meet Jesus. And so today we're continuing our third part, enjoying God in worship. We'll then go on to in spirit and in community in the following weeks. But it's good to be talking about worship. It's a subject very, very close to my heart. I'm passionate about worship. But before we dig into that, friends, has anyone here ever heard? Coca-Cola. <laughs> Coca-Cola, yeah? We've all heard of Coca-Cola. Mm. That's good. You've got to go full fast. I mean, if you're going to do Coca-Cola, you've got to go full fast. In my opinion. <laughs> but have you ever heard the famous slogan, Enjoy Coca-Cola? Yeah? Anyone ever heard of Enjoy Coca-Cola? Okay. 
knew and loved when that ad was actually invented, when, when that ad campaign was first aired. Any guesses? Come on, friends, don't be shy. 20 years ago? 120 years ago. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a long shot. <laughs> Anyone else, when Enjoy Coca-Cola was first penned, the concept first came up. No, come on. 1940 or 40 years ago? 40 years ago, very close. Very close. 30 years ago, no, closer to him. 40, 40, uh, 1982, friends. 42, 42 years ago, hey? 1982. You know what? It needed to tick some certain boxes, okay? They were looking to try and obviously promote Coca Cola, more sales, etc. But the, the ad agency, this is some of the stuff that they needed to communicate through that campaign. To be a beacon of simplicity and unity. A promise of the simple joys that life had to offer. Create a, a sentiment of joy and refreshment. Uncomplicated joy, an invitation to savor life's simpler pleasures. The slogan needed to catch the eye and linger in the mind. Okay. Who thinks it succeeded? Anyone think that that campaign was a success? Enjoy Coca-Cola. I mean, it's pretty hard to find someone who's never heard enjoy Coca-Cola. I think it's brilliant. And the title of my sermon today, friends, is indeed enjoy worship, enjoy God, and then enjoy a Coke. Okay, so you're going to have some Cokes outside. Um, they won't be cans, but you can go and pour yourself a nice fresh glass of Coke after the service. Mm. It is good. But first, we're going to enjoy worship, friends. We're called to enjoy worship, okay? Enjoy God. Okay. But I think there's a connection. There's a connection between enjoying worship and that, that campaign. Okay, what that campaign had to take, some of those boxes. Joy and refreshment. Think of worship, joy and refreshment. Think worship, think simplicity and unity. Okay? Something beautifully simple about worship. Unity, united, like we were this morning, united in worship, magnifying our God's name. Worship being one of the simple joys in life. Hey, how cool. One of the simplest joys in life is to actually gather like this or at home alone, put on YouTube, or just dance around in the garden with the book of Psalms, just setting your attention on Jesus. Simple joy, right? Uncomplicated joy. An invitation to savor. Wow, think about worship. An invitation to savor God, His Lordship, Jesus, what He's done for us. And worship can indeed catch the eye or ear. And linger, okay? Our songs can just stick with us. I love them. So that's my connection. That's how my mind works. I see those kind of connections. And I think it's beautiful for us to try and think along those lines. But if you want to um, have, some, have some more full definitions in terms of what is worship, I'm going to give you some. So we worship God primarily for who He is and what He's done. Worship is the reverential response of creation to the all-encompassing magnificence of God. The only proper object of worship is the one God who created and redeemed humanity. Worship can take place in the context of confession, lament, praise, thanksgiving, and adoration. Worship could manifest itself in many activities, including song, dance, ritual, preaching, and prayer. Physically, worship could involve bowing the knee, lying prostrate, or lifting hands before God. I love this. Every act of obedience to Christ, no matter how mundane, when done to His glory, is an act of worship. Amen, indeed. This last one that I'll read to you. It is as natural to worship as it is to live. The feeling and expression of high adoration, reverence, trust, love, loyalty, and dependence upon a higher power, human or divine, 
is a necessity to man. These sentiments towards something or somebody, and whether real or imaginary, appeal to a greater or less degree to every man. And that is some, and, and that something determines his worship. Friends, if you can leave with anything this morning, it is the, the point, the encouragement, the exhortation to us to enjoy worship. Enjoy worship, friends. Enjoy God through private and corporate worship. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together like this. God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for what you're wanting to do this morning. And I just invite you, Holy Spirit, come. We welcome you here, Holy Spirit. Come reveal the Father to us. Come open our hearts to see you, to understand you, to grow more in love with you. That reverential response, who you are, and the joy that we have in being able to worship. So thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for this day and bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Friends, would you open your Bibles, please? Physical Bible, any physical Bible. Would you raise a physical Bible if you have one yet? And your phone does not count. That is not a physical Bible. Yes. Come on, we've got two in the house. Three, four, five, six, seven. Two hands. Two hands. We've already counted yours, Mario. Come on, friends. That's only more than seven or eight. It's my mind. We've got to get a bit better than that. Bring your physical Bible. They're beautiful things. Take them off the shelf. Dust them off. Put your phone down to be distracting. <laughs> Read a Bible. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, I'm not teasing. And, um, okay, John chapter 4. Why don't you open there? Or, well, of course, we're that good to you that we do provide slides um, that has the scripture. I'm reading from the ESV this morning. Um, the context to that Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. So Samaritan, they were not Jewish, although they, they have a belief in God, same God, um, but the Jews didn't really like them, and, and so there was a lot of conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews, and this leads from context, she also lived a, a wild life, a, a, a broken life, um, really sad, actually, when we read the story of this, of this woman's life, and culturally in its day, so radical, so not done, what Jesus did. He spoke to this lady that she was drawing water from the well. And we pick it up in verse 20 of chapter 4. So she's now saying to Jesus, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Amen. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Amazing friends, this verse has already been referenced this morning. We've already read this verse when Don is leading us in worship. It's come from a lot of what we've sung and has been encouraged through Ben. Love this passage. And friends, when we understand this passage, when we just pick this passage apart a little, we can find such joy in what this passage invites. Knowing what Jesus is saying and how this exchange works brings joy to us, friends. And we can enjoy worship through this passage. So firstly, I love the where. The where. It's not important. And that is good news, friends. This lady, the Samaritan, she, her, 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 her ancestry, her lineage, they were all about this mountain. They worshipped on this mountain. She then says, but I know that you Jews, you said that you've got to worship in the temple, in Jerusalem. But Jesus, he breaks that apart. He says it's not about the place. 
It's not about, about where you go. Because of Him, because of His life, because of Him coming to earth, God sending His one and only Son as a perfect sacrifice for her sins, for their sins, for your and my sin. And He's saying what He did, what He's come to do, it tears down that dividing line. That temple curtain, actually, there was a curtain in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the, of the temple. And you couldn't go beyond that curtain. But his death and resurrection, friends, that tore that curtain in two. And so because of this passage, what, what, he, what he knew he had come to do, he's saying, no, the place is not important. The place is not important. Not on this mountain. Not in Jerusalem. And you see how then, in verse 21, he introduces the Father. It's no longer this distant, far off, removed God. But he talks about the Father. This invitation to know this personal God. Intimately, you and I can know Him. He's telling her, we can know Him. All access is granted. It's not about the place. It's not even about we can only worship in this hall. Or in our other hall where we normally meet. It's not about a building. Beautiful old structure as you drive in. Incredible, beautiful place of worship. And friends, it's not about the place. Jesus is saying no. No, because of his death, because of his life, his resurrection, we can worship anywhere. It's not about the place. It's not about the where. And friends, that is good news. That God, Jesus' relationship, it's not restricted to a building, to a temple, as we've referenced this morning. It's in our heart, which he goes on to speak about. Firstly, though, he says the who. Who we worship. Who. We can know who we worship, and that's the Father. The Son opens that way to the Father. It's not some distant, far off God, as I've already said. But He says it's the Father. You can worship the Father. And then I love that verse. So verse 22, He's saying, You worship what you don't know. You worship what you don't know. Friends, do we worship who we, what we don't know? That begs a, a reflection. We've all got to reflect on that. Am I just coming in here singing songs because it's a screen full of songs? Everyone else is singing, so I'll just sing. Or are we worshipping Him from a place of knowing Him? We can only reflect on that. Do we worship who we know? And this, is, this, this account is just beautiful because in verse 26, He says to her, I who speak to you am He. He reveals Himself to her. I am the Messiah. I am the one that you are wanting to come. The one that you are expecting will come. It's me. I'm here. That's what Jesus is saying. And friends, He says that to every single one of us today. For centuries, past, eternity, future, we are all invited into this beautiful exchange of relationship. Him revealing Himself to us. Saying, I know you. I love you. I died for you. I rose again for you so that you could have access. You could have relationships. You can have friendship. No longer divided. No longer separated. I who speak to you am He. Don't worship who you don't know. He says you can know me and then you can worship. When we know Him, friends, then worship is real. We can enjoy worship and we can enjoy God through knowing who it is that we worship. He talks about the how. It's a popular verse to some. They know and worship in spirit and in truth. And it's not about these external actions, these rituals. They would have known in that time the custom was full of ritual, full of tradition, full of things that you had to do. That's what worship was. It was bringing an offering, a goat, a dove, a lamb, bringing it to the priest. That would be slaughtered, a sacrifice that you could be um, forgiven and then have access again to, to sort of a relationship at a distance. So in their culture, this is, this is like a list of things that they had to do. But he's saying, no, 
It's in spirit and truth. It's pointing to a heart, an attitude of our hearts, which again is why worship is not restricted to a temple, to a building. It can be anywhere because it's from the heart. As one commentator writes, worship in spirit and in truth does not necessarily mean non liturgical or non institutional worship, nor does it favor inward individual worship over outward corporate worship. Rather, it is worship appropriate to the nature and character of God. And if God's nature is revealed only in God the one and only, the one who is right beside the Father, then such worship is impossible until the one and only has come. Now that the revealer is present in the person of Jesus, such worship can and will become reality. Friends, that is Jesus. He makes worship in spirit and truth possible. It's only in Jesus. There's no other way that we can worship in spirit and in truth. So when we say this phrase that is wonderful and encouraging and get lots of amens, friends, it is still only in the person of Jesus that we're able to worship in spirit and truth. And then there's this beautiful inclusive invitation who the Father is seeking such worship as friends. He's seeking, he's looking. And that again begs the question to us, will we be found? Will we be the ones saying, yes, I'm going to worship in spirit and in truth? It's an, it's, it's, it's an invitation to all friends. It's not exclusive. Not, not only on those on the, on the good list is this invitation extended, to, but it's to all of us, friends. All of us are invited to know the Father, to, to worship in spirit and in truth. The Father is seeking. He desires you and I. Then turn over your Bible, turn in your Bible, a few chapters, a few books down the line. In 1 Peter chapter 2, this is Peter, one of Jesus' disciples. Jesus is now ascended into heaven after his resurrection. And Peter is writing this letter. And he says that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love this, friends. This speaks to identity and it speaks to purpose. If there's any question around your identity this morning, this should and can dispel it, displace it forever. Your identity, chosen. Your identity, royal. Your identity, holy. Your identity, a people for his own possession. You're struggling with who you belong to. You belong to Jesus. Purchased by his blood, friends. If you don't know who you are, read this. You are chosen. You're grafted in. You're part of his family. No longer on the outside, looking in. Part of that family, friends. Royal is your nature. Royal is your identity. Not a slave, not on the outside. Holy. is changed from the inside out because of Jesus. That's right. This should bring joy, enjoyment. Friends. This should bring a wow. Yes. I can only but worship when you read of those definitions. It's a response to the revelation of who this God is, what Jesus has done. How can we just sort of sit back in a blue chair? Yeah, I'm worshiping. I'm worshiping. Friends, our hearts should come alive and break out of our chest yes. and say, wow, yes. Yes. how good is this God? Right. Amen. Anyone struggling with purpose? What is my life about? What should I do? Sure, we have questions around what to study, what to go and become once we've studied. There's all good things and God reveals that. But friends, he's not bound by whether or not you make the right choice to be a plumber or an accountant. It doesn't really matter. Yes, you'll build the enjoyment and fun and whatever you choose. But friends, our purpose is to proclaim the excellencies. Another translation says, declare his praises. Friends, that is our purpose. That our lives would be a resounding uh, advertisement. Enjoy Coca-Cola. Your lives should be saying, enjoy Jesus, enjoy God. In all that we do, our purpose is to praise him. To acknowledge his goodness and see that the world around us see that. 
that when they look at your life, they're like, man, there's something about you. I want to know. Mm. Your life shouts about something greater than who you are. Yeah? yeah. Yes, amen. Purpose issues God in Jesus' name. Because our purpose is found in declaring His wonderful praises. Jump back to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. I'm going to read two sections here before we wind up. Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Something like the practical now. Yeah. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. I don't think you have verse 3 there. No, you know. Um, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Verse 3 just re emphasizing, in case you've forgotten who you are, you're one of his sheep, friends. You're one of his. You belong to him. He made you. You are his. Okay, let's continue. Verse 4 Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Friends, amen. 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 Friends, this is how we do it. This is part. This is a part of how we do it. A joyful noise. Who cares about the person next to you? It's a joyful noise. Serving him with gladness. A gladness of heart. Not an obligation, not a duty. Singing, we can sing in worship, friends. Come in with thanksgiving. You want to know how to enter the presence of God? Anyone want to know how to enter the presence of God? Thanksgiving in our hearts, friends. A heart that is thankful. A heart that acknowledges God. Do you know why? Because thankfulness, it, 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 it sort of cuts through pride. Because thanks, not about me. I'm not living here today because I'm so smart. It's the goodness of God. And I can thank Him for that. No matter how low you are in life, or how amazingly influential and powerful you are, it is God. It is His goodness to us that gives us breath in our lungs. Thankful. We all have something to be thankful for. Praise. Like a joyful noise, enter His courts with praise. Give thanks. Bless His name. For he is good. His steadfast love and joy forever. Mm. Friends, that should bring joy. Mm. I can enjoy God. That all sounds like fun, right? A joyful noise. Mm. Gladness. Singing. Thanksgiving. Praise. Thanks. Bless. That sounds like a lot of fun to me. Sounds like a lot of fun to come into his presence. So you're already in Psalm 100. Just go back with you to Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times, friends. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Friends, this is the when. When do we worship? All times. All times. When you're in the bath, that can be worshipped. When you're brushing your teeth, that can be worshipped. When you're standing here singing and praising and having a coffee out there, that can be worshipped, friends. In all times and in all circumstances, not only the good friends, I know this is where it can become a sacrifice. Because when you don't feel like worshiping, that's when it is a sacrifice. That's when it costs you something. I reference those people in the Old Testament who bring their pigeon or their goat or whatever it would be. That would cost them. That would be. That would cost them. It's not cheap. That's not. That's not. It doesn't cost them. It's not free. That it take that out of their livestock, out of their possessions. And bring it. Friends, worship needs to cost us something too. Amen. Amen. If it's not costing you, it's not worship. It needs to cost us, friends. Because there are times when it's not easy to sing, Great are you, Lord. Or singing about the goodness of God when life sucks. But friends, that is a sacrifice. Declaring who He is regardless of where we're at. You know what I love about that book? And this is so true in my own life, friends. Those times when I don't want to worship, those times when I'm like, ah, I just, I just can't. I just, I just don't want to. 
But when I pray the Spirit, I do it in spite of how I feel. Man, this breakthrough. Something shifts. Not necessarily a physical breakthrough right away. It's not like, oh, I need money, so I worship and all of a sudden money comes. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But something in my heart shifts. Something in my mind shifts. You're feeling low. You're feeling down. The last thing you feel like doing is getting out of bed and praising God. But you do it, and things start to change. Amen. It's a promise for us. Amen. You enter His presence with thanksgiving. You do, and that changes things. His presence changes things. Amen. We can't get away from that fact, friends. His presence changes things. Enjoying worship, friends. We can enjoy worship. When we enjoy worship, we enjoy God. Privately, corporately. I'm going to step, up, step into some practicals in a second before we close. But friends, as we draw to a close, I just want, to sh- I want you to shut your eyes, please. And just get a picture of this. I'm going to read from 2 Chronicles chapter 5. There is a slide for it, but as I said, I would encourage you to shut your eyes and just listen. I want you to imagine this. Because this is a scripture that God gave me around our church. About this church, about what we're doing, about what we're pressing into. Ben spoke about vision in style and in heaven. This is part of that method. This is part of the how we get there. Second Chronicles 5. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Friends, it's this picture of glory, the glory of God, the presence of God, the manifest presence of God in our midst as we come in unity, said that word in unison, to declare His praises, to thank Him, to praise Him. The trumpeters, the singers, that's all of us, friends. Some of us might get the front of the microphone and the guitar. The rest of us might just be in the hall, just singing in unity. With a heart that is toward God in thanksgiving. And I believe we're going to see this, friends, His presence in a new way. His glory filling these meetings, this place, our connect groups, all that we do, His glory, His presence in a new, tangible way that is so attractive. That is what we're going to see. Slav change is through God's presence coming, moving, changing hearts. Because, friends, He is attractive. And he is powerful, and his presence changes everything. As one commentator writes about this portion of scripture, he says, The appearance of the visible glory of the manifestation of God's presence was God's response to the unified worship of his people, as also occurred at the dedication of Moses' tabernacle. This experiential truth demonstrates the essential role of prioritized unified worship as a catalyst for welcoming the glory of God's presence among his people. We also see that true worship declares the character of God himself, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Amen. That raising our voices in unified worship, you can open your eyes if you like, and declaring that he is good, declaring that his steadfast love endures forever. Friends, we declare the character and nature of God. He is worshipped. When He is worshipped, He responds, friends. And when He responds, lives are changed. Cities are changed. Nations are changed. So practically, what can we do? Four things. We can choose worship. Choose worship. Because, friends, we all worship. We just have the privilege of who we worship, what we worship. It could be our car, it could be our status, it could be our bank, our bank balance, it could be our anything, relationships, friendships, husband, wife, your sports, whatever it might be. We all worship friends, but we get to choose the object of our worship. We get to choose friends, and we get to choose whether we delight in it or whether we don't. 
We get to choose that, friends. We get to practice private worship. And I'd encourage you to practice private worship. Worship is not about Sunday morning, that thing we do for half an hour, 40 minutes before the guy speaks. No. Practice it at home, friends. In the car. On the toilet. Guys, God's not surprised. Wherever we are, we can worship. Put on YouTube. Whatever your favorite streaming service. So there's so we are so spoiled for incredible worship out there. But also just picking up this thing, the Bible, going to the book of Psalms, that is like an incredible song of worship and praise and adoration. If you're stuck for inspiration, go there. But practice private worship, friends. Prepare for corporate worship. Friends, this is what we do here. This is an overflow. It needs to be an overflow. If it's not an overflow of what's happening at home, then it's just a performance. And God's not about performance, friends. What do we say? Spirit and truth? It's heart. So when we come here together, it should be just the culmination and overflow of what's been going on in the week. Going on at home. In the car. Wherever it is. We can worship anywhere. Through so many means, friends. Sometimes we need to reflect, to confess. You know, taking time alone. That's also how we prepare for worship. Because sin separates, right? Yeah, sin separates. But when we are aware of that, we say, Lord, forgive me. We just confess, we just come, and He's so faithful, He forgives, He redeems. And that separation is gone, that blockage is gone, and we're able to just worship. A little bit, a little bit easier, right? Anyone ever had that? Sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes we need to acknowledge where we are, take stock, bring that before God, and then worship can just be a bit easier. A little bit, a little bit less distracting. Lastly, learn to sacrifice. So as I said, it's not about us. It's not about you. What we do here, when we worship, enjoying worship, enjoying God, it's not about you. It's not about whether you feel like it. Because just sometimes you don't. It's not about us, friends. It's a sacrifice. So won't you stand with me, please?
Maybe it's practice, God, a thing of private worship, and we just don't like it. God, I pray, I, I pray that you'd help us to understand just how beautiful private worship can be, how effective it can be in fighting our battles. Maybe it's preparing. Maybe it's just about, I need to prepare for corporate worship. So we come together corporately, powerful things happen. As we've seen in Scripture, the glory comes. The presence manifests itself. So maybe we need to prepare ourselves. Well, maybe it's just that lesson that we need to learn that it's not about us, but that worship is costly. So Holy Spirit, I thank you that you just seal that in our hearts right now, wherever we're at. You know your people, you love your people. And your heart is for each and every single one of us to enjoy you all. And we delight in you, God, you are glorified. So God, I just pray that you seal that in our hearts this morning. And you take us on. God, we bless your name. We thank you for all that you've done this morning. All that you're going to continue to do, Lord. And God, I thank you that we leave this place enjoying you that bit more. That, 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 that more. So we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, Amen friends. Um, bless you.